The Bible says that the problems we are seeing in the world today come directly from the heart of man. Destructive behavior that once would have been unimaginable is becoming commonplace. Why? What is the cause and what are the solutions? Stay tuned for a word from your Bible. From the time of the Messiah to our modern technological age, much Bible truth has been lost. With the melding of foreign philosophies and teachings unknown to the believers of the first century, the early church began a transformation away from its Hebrew origins. The question we need to ask ourselves is, just how far did it go? Join us for the next half hour as we take you on an incredible journey of biblical understanding as we uncover the foundation of the Christian faith. Are you ready to discover the truth? Most everyone knows that Moses was a great lawgiver, or more correctly, transmitter of the law. After all, it wasn't his law that he brought down from Mount Sinai, but the Father Yahweh's. But did you know that Moses was also a prophet? When he commanded the Levites to place the book of the law in the side of the Ark of the Covenant, he described a time when that law, which reflects our Creator's very mind, personality, nature, and character, he foretold of a time when the Bible's laws would come to mean almost nothing to people and would even be despised. Read what Moses the prophet wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 31, 26. Take this book of the law and put it by the side of the ark of the covenant of Yahweh your Elohim, that it may be there for a witness against you. Witness against you? That means a standard of judgment for your life. Reading further, Moses said in Deuteronomy 31, 29, For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do that which is evil in the sight of Yahweh, to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. He says in the latter days there's going to be a universal turning against Yahweh and his laws. With the widespread disregard for the scriptures, society is skidding toward chaos. Faith in the scriptures is already nearly dead in Great Britain. A minister who travels to England to preach said that the church there holds worship services every other week because they can't get enough worshipers to come every week. And this is a large worldwide denomination. We read a key question in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Very important prophetic insight. Will there be faith on the earth? Humanistic thinking so dominates today that many question whether even murderers or child molesters should be punished. The Apostle Paul warned in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Messiah. He's admonishing against such things as today's all-pervasive political correctness philosophy, which has supplanted the biblical standards of right and wrong in the minds of many. The moral standards of only a few decades back are decayed almost beyond recognition. Personal values are formed by parents, grandparents, and others we grew up with. Whatever their basic values were, our own values become. What happened in the 1960s, however, cracked the moral foundation on which, which this culture was established, and we have been drifting further away ever since. Anyone my age or older who lived before and during that time knows what I mean. Many today are unable to discern properly and correctly, unable to make moral judgments. Their thinking is twisted through human philosophy and deceit. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of our day in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15, condemning this new philosophy that we seem to be under today. 
He says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. And I set a watchman over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, and as for my law, they have rejected it. Fast disappearing are the days when those who claim to be religious, think differently, act differently, and live differently from the rest of society. The world's ways are so woven into the fabric of life that hearts, even hearts of those who say they walk in the truth, are often polluted beyond recognition, if not beyond redemption, at least in relation to someone living 50 years ago. And like Lot, who had a hard time leaving his sinful hometown, they don't even recognize how conditioned by the culture they are. Commitment to the scriptures has become so wishy-washy today that fewer people feel any moral spiritual obligation to really live their faith. Too much of belief today consists of simple lip service, while the real heart's desire is maximum personal entertainment and enjoyment with minimal effort. Should it be the goal of Bible believers to be wealthy beyond their imaginations? Is that what Yahweh promises those who follow Him? Does either the Father in heaven or His Son say, You are guaranteed fabulous affluence and treasures untold if you confess Me? Well, the Bible I read says the believer is given his needs, not necessarily his wants. Nothing in the Word tells us that our singular goal is to be blessed with riches in this life. Our Savior Yahshua certainly was not rich, and neither were any of His disciples. If that is the way it's supposed to be, surely they would have been wealthy in this world's riches and goods. And an example for the rest to follow. If your faith is only a hobby, a just-in-case religion, if you think just an occasional effort is okay, then you need to recommit yourself to the Bible and the Word. You can't fool Almighty Yahweh. He sees hypocrisy. He knows our hearts better than we do. He said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would or wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Frightening words, are they not? It's time to get serious. It is time to discover what the scriptures really teach. Well, stay tuned, we'll be right back after this message. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. And I will bring you the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, Yahweh is my Elohim. Who has ascended into heaven, or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I.
Perhaps you've been asked, do you know the Savior? Today we offer a special booklet called The True Messiah, Have You Discovered Him? This information speaks on the subject of the Messiah, giving you information you probably have never heard before. It's right out of your scriptures if you want to just go to the Bible and read it, but we, we guide you onto many interesting and profound facts, such as when he was actually born, what his name was, what his father's name is, what, in fact, he looked like. Did he have long, blonde, flowing locks, or did he look like any common Jew of his day? We go into why he came to this earth, what he taught. Was he out to change and completely upset the religious teaching of his day? Uh, why he died, how he died, and whether he's coming back, and for what reason. Right for the true Messiah, have you discovered him? And we think you'll be fascinated by the information. Just look at the address there on the screen, or you can download it off our website. The resurrection of the first fruits, when the Messiah Yahshua returns and gathers his elect, has very tough eligibility standards. Yahweh is looking for the cream, the best of the best, and he's not going to settle for just a half-hearted commitment, an occasional try, or a once-in-a-while effort. He's training the very priests today who will serve under his son in his kingdom. They'll have undergone the fires of refinement. They'll have been through the mill, so to speak, experienced in many trials, and have had their faith tested and proved, and they will have overcome. Tribulation brings out the best in a person, and the real person then is revealed through that. A news report after 9-11 showed that half of those polled said they were more interested in religion after September 11th than they were before the attacks on the World Trade Center. It was an interesting report, and interesting to note that many people no longer had much use for the more trivial matters of life in the weeks following those attacks. Hollywood nearly ground to a halt. Sports events were canceled. No one felt much like being entertained. It was just too serious a time. And as terrible as it was, September 11th is just a taste of what is to come on this earth according to your Bible. And it's time we woke up as a nation and come to grips with our own tenuous existence and learn what is in store for the future. The Savior, the most important prophet of all, said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, to prepare for wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Now, he didn't say this because the status quo would continue, but there would be a great increase in the numbers and severities of these occurrences. The biggest, mistake to, in, the biggest mistake today's Bible believers make is in not realizing that a commitment to the one they worship requires one's entire involvement, day in and day out, and not just a visit to a church once a week. A person's faith must be lived, not just alleged. Almighty Yahweh used the tool of calamity whenever his people drifted away from him. It was the tool of punishment used to bring them, through repentance, back to worshiping him. He would allow a foreign king to come in, invade, and then carry them off, such as he did to Babylon and to Assyria and some of these other places to get them to realize that what they had done was very upsetting to him when they turn away from him after they had made a commitment to follow and be in the covenant promise that he made with them. And there's coming a day in the not too distant future when this planet will rock and reel on its axis because of the sins of man. We read about it in the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 4, verse 22. For my people are foolish, they know me not, they are sottish children, and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was waste and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved to and fro. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. Much of this earth will resemble a war zone. In fact, it will be a war zone. 
Revelation 6 is a parallel text to Jeremiah 4, giving more details about the devastation coming to this earth. Verse 12 there reads, And I saw when he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the whole moon became as blood, and the stars of the heaven fell into the earth as a fig tree casts her unripe figs when she is shaken of a great wind. And the heaven was removed as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the princes, and the chief captains, and the rich, and the strong, and every bondman and free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they say to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath is come, and who is able to stand? Our Savior will return in wrath? Yes. That's exactly what it says. He himself inspired these words written by John in the book of Revelation. And now it's time for Prophecy and History with Randy Foliard. Prophecy and History with Randy Folio. Many people ask, what are the signs that we'll see before the Messiah's return? Well, our Savior in Matthew 24 spoke about five signs before His coming. Let's read about these signs. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. Our Savior says there, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. He says, See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He goes on and says, For nation shall rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and there shall be pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. He goes on to say, All these are the beginning of sorrows. So here we see some of the signs prophesied to occur before the end of this age. Our Savior said that we would hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, I believe that what we've seen in the last few years might be the, the initiation of this prophecy. The world that we live in today, friends, is not a world at peace. Today, war is no longer a threat or a rumor, but a reality of life for millions. The Messiah said here that nation would rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, the word nation here is from the Greek word ethnos and means a specific race or nationality. So we see here that there will be civil wars but uh, before our Savior's coming, as we see in many nations today, including nations such as Uganda, Nigeria, Somalia, Palestine, many others today. Now along with civil wars, our Savior also prophesied that there would be wars between kingdoms or nations as we continue to see in the Middle East and other locations. Besides traditional war, we've also seen increase in terrorism throughout this world with groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Al-Jihad, and of course, Al-Qaeda, which we're all familiar with. Now, along with war, Yahshua also prophesied that we would see famine and disease before His coming. While it's true that most of us in this nation have more than what we need, there are millions of others suffering from starvation worldwide. For example, according to the, to the non-for-profit organization CARE, more than 840 million people in the world are malnourished. 799 million of them live in the developing world. More than 153 million of the world's malnourished people, now listen, this is our children under the age of five. Six million children under the age of five die every year as a result of hunger. According to Bread for the World, another non-for-profit organization dedicated to the education of world hunger and poverty, every day almost 16,000 children die from hunger-related causes. That's one child every five seconds. In 2006, almost 986 million people lived below the international poverty line, earning less than $1 per day. 
Among this group of poor people, many have problems obtaining adequate, nutritious food for themselves and their families. As a result, 820 million people in the developing world are undernourished. They consume less than the minimum amount of calories essential for sound health and growth. You know, as awful as famine is, our Savior also prophesied that there would be pestilence or disease. For example, diseases today are incurable, such as AIDS, Ebola, herpes, and many others. According to the Center for Disease Control, over half a million people were killed by AIDS in 2006 in the U.S. alone. It's also reported by the CDC that over 20 million people have died so far from the AIDS epidemic. According to the CDC in a 2005 report, 67% of new cases of AIDS were due to homosexual activity. The next leading cause to exposure was due to drug use at 18%. Our Father in Heaven warned us that if we would rebel, that there would be consequences to that rebellion. Today, friends, I believe that we're seeing those consequences. Now, along with war, famine, disease, our Savior also prophesied of earthquakes in different and various places. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, we had five major earthquakes alone in the month of July, ranging with a magnitude from 5.4 to 7.7. .7. In verse 8 of Matthew 24, our Savior said that all these things were the beginning, beginning of sorrows. These prophetic events are what the Bible refers to as the beginning of birth pangs, or as we find in the prophet Jeremiah, the beginning of Jacob's trouble. As our Savior encouraged us, friends, let us watch and prepare for the time to come. And may our Father in heaven, Almighty Yahweh, guide us in all truth. And may Yahweh bless you. Thanks, Randy. We know that the Savior is going to return to this earth. The Bible says so in many, many places. And he's going to put up with the world's present rebellion for only so long. And then he will return in fury to destroy his enemies and gather his elect in the resurrection. Following the September 11th tragedy, newspaper and magazine articles were asking, why were the 3,000 people who perished not divinely spared when the Twin Towers fell? But that question was a bit late in coming. Where was Yahweh when the Tower of Siloam fell a couple thousand years ago? Read about what Yahshua the Messiah said about a tower calamity in Luke chapter 13, verses 4 and 5. Those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were offenders above all men that were dwelling in Jerusalem? I tell you not. No, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. We suffer on this earth because we live in an environment of sin. It was not meant to be this way. Man was not supposed to rebel. He was supposed to obey his creator and live a life of utopia and happiness. But man chose a different route. Man decided to do it his way. And for 6,000 years, this world has witnessed the result of that rebellion of sin and wickedness. Untold suffering and anguish resulted from man saying, no, I won't go that way. The question that needs to be asked is, where does this nation and this world get off defying the Creator who made us? Where is the man or woman who will turn to Him in repentance and follow His ways? Yahweh's hand of protection is being lifted from this planet, and He'll allow the consequences of man's evils that they so much enjoy to destroy them. Where is Yahweh when the bad happens? It's a question that assumes He approves of man's sinful lifestyles and protects us from ourselves. No, Yahweh will allow us to harm ourselves until one day we learn to bow our knees before Him and beg to know His will in our lives, and only then will things change. But until such a time, we will continue to see our world worsen and suffer and the experience the consequences of sin that we see all over the place. The Israelites were expected to dedicate their very lives to the Father, day in and day out. 
One of the ways he impressed that upon them was through their daily sacrifices. That animal had to come from each individual's flock, and thereby they learned that true dedication comes at some cost to each person. That is the exact opposite of the prosperity doctrine so popular today. Yahweh has established certain criteria, and He won't lower the bar for anyone. These criteria are His laws. Notice the criteria Yahweh judges by in Revelation 20, 12, where it says, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, books is the Greek biblos, from which the word Bible is translated. Judgment will be based on the scriptures and the commands given therein. On what criteria will we be judged then? Notice that the passage says, according to our works. What we do in this life is what the judgment will be based on. Now, any judge judges the guilt or innocence of a person on whether they committed the crime or not, or had a part in it. Their judgment is based on the past behavior of the accused, and it's the same with the Father in heaven. Revelation 22.12 says, Yahshua will give rewards to every man according as his work shall be. Yahweh hates a lukewarm or Laodicean attitude. Your heart is either in it or it is not. Revelation 3.14 is a warning to the Laodicean believers where it says, And to the angel of the assembly in Laodicea write, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. The true believer who decides to live for his heavenly Father needs to do so with all his heart, soul, and mind and not be lukewarm, because lukewarm will get us nowhere. Well, that's all the time we have today on Discover the Truth. Join us next time for another edition of Discover the Truth. For the free literature offered on today's program, write to Yahweh's Restoration Ministry, care of Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. You can phone in your request to area code 573-896-9248. Don't forget to ask the operator about obtaining a free MP3 CD, which contains numerous sermons on many different topics. You can also visit our website at www.yrm.org for extensive study articles and online offers for free literature, CDs, and DVDs. We thank you for watching today. Join us again next week and discover the truth at this same time and station.